Now you can start separating this in a, like four source folders maybe and call your compiler for, all, for every source folder separately and in a sequence and hope uh, you get everything. But you know, that's not the nice integration story we are aiming for in Groovy. So you don't really want to do like Groovy C, A from Groovy, Java C, B from B dot uh, Java and again and again, you know, that's not going to be nice. And uh, of course, if you don't want to do multi modules or something like that just to support something like this, so we need a better solution. In 2007, Alex Techman came around with a, a very, very big patch which uh, I was absolutely not happy, happy about because it was so big that it was really, really difficult to review. Like many other of his patches, bright ideas, good ideas uh, lacking on the communication part. And, um, well, and then you have to see how you can handle this code. But it's the start and we decided to take it in. And then of course we had to uh, understand the code, which, is, which was not that difficult in this case, and improve it over time, finding all the corner cases, and it happened over the last several years. So what is the idea of the joint compiler here? We have the Groovy compiler passing the Groovy files and generate an AC, which is like an abstract representation in memory of the sources. And then let it produce Java files for it, but not something which is a complete Java program because like you can do in Groovy things where you uh, throw an unchecked un exception and don't declare it in the throw part, uh, or you can just catch an checked exception which is not declared uh, by a method, things like that. Java wouldn't like that and many other things. So it would be too limiting to just map our crew resources to Java sources. But what we can do, of course, is making stuff that means no body for the methods. So we only have to provide the signatures. And then we can call Java C on those stuff files, which will call Java C to generate class files for the stuff files. But more important, importantly, it will enable Java C to compile the Java parts using those stuffs. And then we can use the generated classes of the real Java sources. So in my example here, that would be for B and C. We can use those generated classes from the Java compiler and continue our compilation in Groovy to finish compilation for Groovy files. So there are different ways to call it on the command line. You can use it uh, with Groovy C and the J option to enable joint compilation. And you can uh, give additional options to control like, um, I think, I actually forgot what you can control at all. I, there's a documentation about it in our wonderful uh, Groovy Long uh, website with, uh, which uh, shows all the options you can use and what they do. I suggest doing that. The, uh, by normally, the Groovy C will use the uh, JDK Java C, but not the program Java C. It will programmatically instantiate the compiler. You have to remember, this is, um, when this was implemented, it was around 2007. Back then there was no compiler API like there is today. So we instantiated uh, some internal classes. And we actually still do. Something we have to change for JDK 9 because we cannot access those classes anymore. <coughs> then there is an ARM task. Special notice to be taken of the embedded Java C task here which is actually the ant Java C task revamped for usage through the Groovy C task. And you can do all you can do in 
uh, and with Java C with the Groovy C part. It will even, you can, you can even say, for example, I want to use JAX. I don't know if anybody is still using JAX for compilation or uh, any other Java compiler. I mean, there hardly is anymore. But back then it was more interesting. So you, you can uh, use the AND normal mechanisms to set a different compiler, and Groovy C will then use this different compiler. Uh, I was considering making a complete POM uh, XML for uh, how to use it in Maven 2, but, well, it um, didn't really fit on the slide, so I refer to <coughs> this web page. So for Maven, you usually use the gmaven plus plugin. You mix Java and Groovy sources in the same directory. The Maven plus plugin, the uh, gmaven plus plugin, will attach itself or, you know, it will make itself part of the compilation lifecycle that is present in Maven for Java. It will not define its own lifecycle. This has been attempted before and failed, so they decided to do it different. It's a more complicated version, but uh, for, for the implementation, for the user, it's more easy because everything will just work. Um, just to honorably mention, the first gmaven uh, is not supported anymore. There was supposed to be a gmaven 2 coming, but it got stuck somehow and like at that end and never did the release. That's why gmaven plus is used. Uh, I also want to mention builder, but only shortly because it basically uses the untask. More important, especially here, should be the Groovy plugin in Gradle, where you can do Java and Groovy sources in uh, the Groovy source folder and uh, to get your joint compilation. Of course, you have also the Java source folder, but this one is compiled only for Java. So if you put Groovy files in the Java source folder, the Groovy files will not be compiled. If you put uh, Java sources into the Groovy folder, then uh, it will be done in joint compilation, and that means at the same time, more or less. While if you have it in the Java source folder, you couldn't do a Groovy class extending the Java class and a Java class extending the Groovy class. It's not joint compilation there. The Java compiler that is used for the joint compilation is under the control of Cradle, uh, and they do their own shenanigans to actually realize the extended needs for the infrastructure and to like discover if they even have to compile something. So it's a very flexible solution. And now we should be happy or not? I mean, it solves all the problems. Or maybe not, I don't know. There are problems with this approach. And most of the problems are actually found, well, in the basic architecture of this approach, as well as in uh, a bit in the architecture of the Groovy compiler. Um, I cannot take all of them, so I will explain in detail one example. And it's this long-standing bug, which is from 2009, which is like two years of, uh, after we actually uh, release something where you can use joint compilation. And it's uh, only short after we added transforms. Because this bug is talking about a problem with a delegate. A delegate is a transform, which uh, also was a bit shown by Guillaume in his talk. And in this example, basically, you have a class test with a uh, it's a one-to-one -one copy from the bug report, by the way. So don't play me for the naming. So it's a class test, and we have a property test in there on which we delegate. And we delegate the instance of test delegate, and test delegate has a property name again. That means test should gain a method get name. Uh, sorry. The class test should gain a method get name and a set name method. 
So if you make a now Java method, uh, Java class, then you should be able to instantiate text and call get name on it. Should, but that's not the case. It will fail. Java will not find the get name method. And if you just compile the Groovy part and then look at uh, the class information by reflection or whatever, you will see the get name method. And you will wonder, what? Why is there? Why does Java C not find it? Then you have to dive a bit deeper in how transforms work, actually. And a bit deeper into how the compiler in Groovy works. The compiler is divided in population phases. We have several of them. And a transform is basically a plugin for the compiler to do something with the AC, the abstract representation of the source, to do some shenanigans like adding methods for delegation, for example. This is more or less uh, what you would find if you uh, look at the implementation of a delegate only the header, which defines in what phase it runs, and this phase is called canonicalization. There are several phases, and um, I listed them all here. Basically, you have a passing phase uh, where you create the AST. You have an analysis phase where you give semantics to everything. You have a canonicalization phase in which you like add missing methods or like uh, bridge methods and things like that. Instrumentation, uh, instruction selection we don't really use. You have uh, the class generation phase in which we, of course, generate classes. And we have the output phase in which we write them to disk. So uh, if you want to just do a runtime compilation, then you would stop in the class generation part. And we have the uh, cleaner part, which actually is also empty because we don't need to do cleanup. We leave everything to our collection and hopefully everything works. Um, so I talked a bit more about this kind of thing already in 2006, which is actually before transforms was, uh, were coming. I think in the post was motivated uh, by the upcoming discussion with the joint compiler. Also, and um, right, if you get the data, the slides from the website, you can click the link. Or you go on blackboxgeo.bot and look for chat with Groovy Compiler. All those are still ready today. So why are, uh, are we in canonicalization with the delegate transform? Because a delegate needs to be able to look at the structure of a class it's delegating to. If you compile something which is written in Groovy, this is not really a problem if it's source code, because then we have all the information. But if it's a class, a pre-compiled class, then we first have to resolve the class and load the class and get the information of that. And that happens in semantic analysis. So the earliest phase a delegate can run is at the end of semantic analysis or at somewhere in canonicalization, which doesn't really make a big difference in this case. We decided for canonicalization. Now, as I mentioned already, the Groovy compiler generates stubs. To do that, it also needs class information. So, the sub creation is done at the end of semantic analysis, more or less. Uh, if you add transforms, it might not be the end. Actually, it could be in the middle of semantic analysis. Important is it happens after classes are resolved and loaded and, and uh, investigated and whatever. So, one would think, but uh, if you actually look at the uh, subs that are generated, you find something like, um, but let's take, us, let's take this example here. We have um, a Groovy. We do two star imports, one with a food.bar package, one with a something package. We have a class A, sense, and X. 
So X is either coming from foobar or from something. Before the class resolving step, we don't know if it comes from foobar or something, or if it's actually an invalid reference to some non-existing class or unknown class. So the compiler might be able to resolve X in semantic analysis. And then it would create a sub where you have the uh, getter and setter for the full property from before. You would have all the groovy object methods in there. You will not find uh, the bodies of fields. Uh, you will not, uh, sorry, the bodies of methods. You will not find private information. Uh, you will find partially resolved classes. And as I mentioned already, you can only resolve a class if it exists. So if you have a Java class you want to resolve against, and this Java class is not compiled yet, you cannot resolve it because you don't have the information. So if we don't, if we don't resolve against um, if you don't resolve Java classes, then how do it? Actually, the input mechanism in Groovy and in Java is so similar that we just can, in many cases, write the vanilla name and let Java C do the resolving in the subs, and it will resolve to the same classes. This usually works. It's not a foolproof method, but I actually never got a bug report about that. In the end, the sub generator will then actually run in the conversion phase. Why in the conversion phase? Because to do a full re uh, resolving, you need to resolve all classes, but you don't have all the classes, so you cannot do a full resolving. We can only do a strip down resolving to resolve some things and hope for the best. So if we come back to the delegate example and a look at it uh, uh, then you will find the sub will not have the get name and the set name effort because a delegate did not even run yet. The sub was created in the, after the conversion phase already. Well, that's unfortunate. So and that's because of the trickery I mentioned. We gather some information and we enrich the information uh, in the sub with what we have. But this is uh, like normally if you resolve classes and you don't find a class, you want to fail compilation. This is a stripped down version of the resolving in which we just skip the error part. Basically, we resolve, we resolve what we can, as I said already. And we don't only do some partial resolving, we also call the annotation collector, like for example to make a immutable work, so it at least will appear with its uh, containing annotations. It's not so much for, for transforms, but if you have a huge collection of annotations on your, on your class, for example, for uh, some Java framework, for example, it, it will still be on the sub. We do some analysis with the variable scope and, with, and some stuff with annotation processing. I won't get into details. So, but basically it means we very much miss the feature of transforms if they run too late if we do joint compilation, which is a big drawback. Then there's the crew Eclipse compiler. So what the query Eclipse compiler roughly does is um, it maps the AST of Groovy to JDT, which is like the Java AST the Eclipse compiler is producing, and Eclipse using, is using internally for its analysis in the IDE. The Eclipse compiler can run outside of the IDE as well, but it's still JDT there. And for Groovy to see Java classes, we then need to have some kind of mirroring or bridging between the JDT and the Groovy AST. 
This then allows compilation without using stubs. And this means we can run our transforms because we have the uh, we don't need to do a strip down resolving or anything. We can just use the full Java information that is there. So that will do it or not? I mean, that's the solution. Um, or not? Even though the Eclipse compiler is not bound to the IDE, it's uh, several megabytes heavy. Uh, it means if we would have this as our standard solution for the compilation, it means the Groovy distribution will get several megabytes more heavy and it's already too big. And additionally, this is not standard JDT. This is a heavily patched JDT. And that is because the guys that do JDT are not so eager to open JDT to our languages. It's for Java, not for our languages in the first place. So, hmm. Also, for this to work, the Groovy compilers have this patch as well. Which means, since we don't have many people that, even, that really know details of, the, of JDT, we lack contributors here, and that's actually also the problem of the Eclipse plugin. Besides knowing the Eclipse framework itself, you also need to know about JDT. And this makes the maintainability of this very difficult. So we have the maintainability as a problem, we have the distribution as a problem. And, you know, the size is one thing, but maintainability is important, especially if you are not full-time developer anymore. Then you cannot just rewrite everything. <laughs> you have to work with what you have in a spare time. So, mm, the EO solution is kind of missing. Then we have some ideas. Like, for example, we get more contributors for Groovy Eclipse. Who knows Eclipse in detail? Who knows JT? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. <coughs> then another idea, maybe we can copy the idea. So let's integrate Groovy C with Java C on the AST level instead of using subs. We mirror the Groovy AST to the AST of Java C and vice versa. Then we let Java C use uh, Groovy C to discover classes in uh, produce initial uh, and get the uh, Java C AST for Groovy C. And then we hold somehow Java C and then uh, let Groovy compile the, the Groovy sources and then let continue Java C. Mm, yeah. Um, hmm. The problem is all those sources of Java C, I mean, they are open source, but it's internal APIs. It's not the uh, compilation, compiler front end Sun developed, which is only for reading structures in notation processes, for example. It's not for modifying things. You cannot. With that API, you cannot uh, make new classes visible to the Java compiler, for example. So you need to use the internal versions of it. And the internal versions are for Java. Well, that sounds familiar, actually. So uh, they concentrate on getting the Java features done and getting them right. And they don't care so much about other languages. And um, to make here a full integration story is a bit difficult because you need somebody who knows the internals of Java C, which for example changed a lot between Java 7 and Java 8. You have, uh, which also means, you have a version of the compiler that depends on the Java version. And if they go in uh, to say like in uh, 1850, they have a bigger change compared to 1A20, but then you have an internal big change in a point release, which nobody cares about, uh, especially not that it breaks your joint compilation. And you have to see how you can handle that. So you get into similar problems as with JDT. Maintainability problem. 
So, what do we do now? Well, maybe we should get independent of uh, other parsers. Maybe we should have our own Java parser. Well, we have in the Ruby source code, we have actually a Java parser in there. The, I think RubyDoc is using it. No, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we have it for something, <laughs> but it's not really maintained. It's, well, sometimes something is fixed, but it's, it's not, you know, it works or it doesn't work. That's not good. And uh, we don't have really the energy and the availability of developers who concentrate on Groovy to also maintain a Java parser and fix bugs in there. But there are enough libraries out there that provide a, a parser that you can use. Uh, I discovered, for example, on GitHub, uh, Java Parser, which is a nice library which uh, more or less pro provides some callbacks you can use, and then you can do whatever. You can make an AST, or you can do, uh, you can just print out things, for example. So, why not let it produce a Groovy AST for Java files? Then we have something the Groovy compiler can understand. And we can use this information to compile our Groovy sources. And we, to compile the Groovy sources, we actually don't need any Java compiler anymore. We need only a, a simple, small parser. It, this parser doesn't even need to know method bodies and all the nice uh, syntax features in there. It needs only to be able to extract the signatures. Well, and we have to do class resolving and that, but that's something Groovy can do. And another interesting aspect is that now suddenly we can do a full Groovy C call, have our joint compilation part only for the Groovy files, and then separately call Java C. So I actually tend to say this is not joint compilation anymore. Not, not like before, you don't have two compilers joining hands to compile uh, sources from different languages anymore. So for me, actually, I must say the um, joint compilation approach is was a good one, but it doesn't go far enough, and I think it's uh, time to consider doing a totally different approach. Well, if you if you have followed me here a bit, and if, if you didn't fall asleep, then uh, you should have noticed that there is a steady development from one to the other. For me, this is the logical next step from joint compilation. So it's not joint compilation anymore, but it's um, a result of the development of joint compilation. So the uh, biggest advantages are here, of course, that you don't need to produce stops anymore, and that you can separate the Groovy C and Java C processes. You can, for example, fork Groovy C separately of Java C. You, can, you don't have to pay the memory consumption of Groovy C and Java C anymore. You have to only pay memory consumption of Groovy C, which means a low memory footprint as well. And a very big advantage for the perception part is that you don't see a cradle starting the uh, Groovy compilation and then getting stuck for a long time because the Java compiler is analyzing the hell out of it. And uh, it's really not fast and it tends to get slower with every version. So, I'm actually happy to have them separate. So people can see the real culprit, the real culprit here and not playing Groovy for that. <laughs> Stubs have, of course, other usages that you could have. For example, you can use them for Java doc generation. Uh, not that they have Java comments in them, because the Groovy compiler doesn't support them and doesn't transport them over. <laughs> uh, but, well, you, you can use... Um, uh, you, you can still have them Java doc produce some pages for it and then uh, link, have them linked up with your Java sources at least. And then you could, I, I don't know, call Groovy doc, which actually can do Java files as well. But, uh, well, no, yeah. there are usages. Some people, oh, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Too long talking on one slide. So I initiated this little project. Uh, yeah. You cannot represent all the semantics of uh, Groovy in Java. I, you mean I want to run a ST transformation on Java code? So unlike uh, the joint compilation approaches with the Eclipse Java compiler and the Google Summer of Code idea which uh, miserably failed with the Java C integration, you don't have a two-way mapping. It's only one way. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's uh, not a way mapping at all because you have your separate parser. You are not interacting with Java C at all. So. There is no communication anymore between Groovy C and Java C. As a consequence, they, uh, you cannot do transformations on uh, Groovy files. With the, I think with the Eclipse compiler, this what this, well, in theory at least, it could be possible to do that. Uh, I don't know if it's actually working. I never tried that. But yes, that would be a limitation. On the other hand, um, we could support, for example, annotation processors from the Java world on crew resources then. Not, not because they know the Groovy AST, but uh, we can provide an AST the annotation processors will understand, for example. So this is um, actually one of the goals of my little project that I called Coria. And um, of course, the most important part for me was to finally have full support for trans uh, transformations. To, uh, and then you have, of course, the advantage because you're a subclass, you don't have the problem with writing to disk. And uh, depending on a wider use, and, and with wider, I mean not only the groovy people, which don't really care about how to write a Java parser, but a community around uh, Java parser library that really care about how to use that. So then you have the maintainability of the parser, not by yourself, but another one. Still you can contribute if you want, of course. And, and the other goal is, of course, the annotation process as well, as I mentioned, endless memory usage. And, of, and finally, uh, a Groovy C that doesn't have to be patched to enable that, like for the Eclipse Java uh, compiler. If you have, if, if you think about the Eclipse Java compiler, this is basically the basis of the Eclipse plugin. And for this, you have a different need than for just a poor compilation process. You need, um, for the Eclipse compiler, you need to be able to uh, recover from errors in a different way. To, you have to be able to put markers at the special part and then recover from the problem somehow to com continue compilation and do as much as you can because in your IDE you don't want to just stop here with the compilation. You want to see, oh, this place has an error and later on everything should work. And then there's, uh, for example, uh, transferring Java docs which we don't do right now in, uh, in the Groovy compiler. So the Eclipse people patched the, uh, the Groovy parser to be able to transfer Java docs, which is something we should add, I think, more or less, with a switch to if you want it or not, of course, because uh, it's additional memory consumption. And so if you consider those things, then this is more than just compile it and be done with it. And if there and hopefully uh, fail if there are errors and uh, don't fail if there are no errors, hopefully. So it's a lower 
need for that. And, but you lose things like the maybe possible transformation of sources of Java code, of course. For that, uh, you would have to write a Java compiler based on the Groovy AST. Um, well, we are almost there, I think, but I don't really want to do that. <laughs> really not. <laughs> Some ambition person could do that if he wants to. <laughs> so, but as always, as uh, you have problems with introducing a new tool, um, you have to look at the usage and then consider the impact. So if you are going to do a completely new Groovy compiler or front end, then we will have to have a problem with like the untask and with the uh, plugins for Maven and Gradle, and it's very important that you have support for Gradle uh, because the GUI build itself needs Gradle support, otherwise, it will not work. Then you don't have a running version of Groovy anymore, which is not what you want at all, I think. Maybe uh, but this is it's an experimental project right now and uh, maybe it's possible to use the existing front end. But I will, once, once this had a bit more time to measure, then uh, we have to talk with the Gradle guys if, uh, about how to do the integration. Maybe they have some bright ideas about how to integrate such a compiler better and uh, actually improve the overall situation of compilation in Gradle or in Maven for the few people that don't still hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, we will need to have some, some I, originally I thought we can maybe do it without any changes in the Groovy compiler, but um, I discovered after actually trying things out that there are some corner cases which will need some tweaking in the Groovy compiler. Small changes, but it's uh, things you have to do in the compiler, which means this uh, new joint compiler would only work with versions later than, with releases later than the one, uh, with releases that have the patch in it. So you cannot just use a Groovy 1.8 in the joint compilation, for example. Right now, the Java compiler is surprisingly small. It's uh, three classes and 500 lines of code. And it already does some joint compilation. That's uh, interesting, or not? I mean, three classes and 500 lines of code. On the other hand, I know a Groovy framework which is like 1,000 lines of code, and uh, it's, a, it's a very feature-rich thing. So you can do a lot in 500 lines of Groovy code. If it were Java, then this would be probably 3,000 lines or something like that. Um, but we are not talking about Java here. In the end, probably such a project would have to be written in um, either static compiled Groovy or in Java itself to have this tiny little bit of speed that you most probably don't need, um, but um, our frameworks like uh, Cradle depend on well, users of Gradle from the industry that claim the crew is slow, I should say. This uh, little project is currently my free time project. It's on uh, GitHub. The last, the, the current version is not very actual and running actually, so it's really very experimental, the newest version I have on my laptop. And um, I developed it mostly during Hacker Garden in, in Basel. So. It's really a hobby project, but I already got contributors. That's, I have one contributor. <laughs> he contributed the test cases I did made together with him. That's the fun thing about Hacker Garden, that you can uh, try to convince people to use your brand new stuff. So this approach will need work, but there are possibilities to solve this problem. And uh, I mean, you could you could go really crazy. You could think about uh, maybe not using strictly the Groovy AST. You could make like a mirroring structure of a more general AST. 
which the Groovy ACU is substructure of and then, well, integrate with other languages. And then have maybe a joint compilation between uh, Scala and Groovy and Java with an intermediate presentation in memory through an AST. You could get even more crazy and make an LVM VR code representation. Then you, you can compile it to native code, <laughs> even for all uh, platforms. So, you know, the fantasy is the limit. Uh, practice is, of course, the deciding factor. So, first would be to get something working actually before you get crazy with features. Always, you will never produce anything. But I think what you should get from this is. Uh, joint compilation is a great tool and it works very nicely already uh, if you want your transforms to work and they are running in a later phase then you will either have to use currently the Eclipse compiler which also can be used from Haven for example the GMA plus supports the usage of the Eclipse compiler the Eclipse compiler can be used in ARNT, in Cradle, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I have not tried that. And uh, then you can, then you have also your transform support. But in the long term, I'm trying to get this project running and have an actual new compiler that supports at least Java and Groovy compilation on, on a new level. And I think it's a more slim solution. And I hope that uh, I will get more contributors for this and that we then have finally an even better version. So that's the end of my talk, more or less. <laughs> um, we have still five minutes for questions if you want to. And either you raise your hands and I call you, or you come here, whatever, feel free to ask. Or if you are just um, falling asleep because I'm talking somehow slow because I'm a bit ill today <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm not very energetic, then uh, I will not mind that as well. <laughs> and it's soon lunch time, so feel free to just go and take lunch or ask me during lunch. Thank you for your attention.